Uh, I'm going to introduce Aman Kumar, uh, and then I will introduce our three other uh, panelists this afternoon. Aman, welcome, and I'm very happy to introduce a MediaX Distinguished Visiting Scholar, Aman Kumar, also a graduate from the Stanford Symbolic Systems Program. Uh, Aman is a member of the Impact Leadership Program in the office of the CEO at SAP, uh, where he focuses on consumerism, simplification, and business agility. He has also played a very special role as advisor to the CIO of the Republic of Estonia, and works as a, an advisor to startups in both Silicon Valley and uh, Boston. Uh, interesting role that he has in, uh, we've talked about uh, change making, organizational change and the tr digital transformation that's underway. Uh, Aman's role with the, in the office of the CEO is to uh, enable uh, transformation both internally at SAP and also to inspire the services and the products that SAP will deliver to their enterprise clients that will enable transformation. And uh, he's going to say a few words about um, making that change, but also about workforce pathways. And um, Ahmad, you're on. Thank you, and thank you, thank you, Martha, for that kind, kind introduction. Um, when Martha and I talked about my spending some time with you this afternoon. It was um, both personally and professionally meaningful uh, for me because um, since I have a, a speech impediment, I guess you have all seen the King's Speech, the movie, if you haven't, go out and see it. Uh, but what that's meant for me personally is that from a workforce pathways perspective is that I've had to design my own pathway profession, pr pr professionally to, to create impact and value. And I wanted to share just a couple stories along the way of three different kinds of organizations and how they look at talent management, often in unconventional ways. Uh, I'll plan to talk for about five to seven minutes and then leave the rest for Q and A. So one story is from the tiny Republic of, of Estonia, which has a population of 1.6 million people. And from an American perspective, one might ask them, one might ask, what could a country of a million people possibly have to teach the rest of the world? When you get there, you realize that their lack of human capital has actually forced them to come up uh, with some incredible sol solutions because uh, they can't take human labor for granted. So their first e-tax system, their e-healthcare system, and so on, were all written to assume that, uh, uh, that the repetitive processes would be, uh, would be automated, and what would be left would would be for uh, people, the stuff that, that required judgment and empathy, which means that today they, are, they have, by luck, pos positioned themselves well in a changing world. The second story comes from SAP, where we are now uh, about 48 years old, uh, $130 billion enterprise, and a 90,000 strong workforce. From the very uh, early days of the company's founding, and with a long history 
in uh, German and European labor laws, one of the core principles of our organization was that it be a worker-friendly organization. And so today, um, one of the best and most exciting things about being there is representing what it means to be a worker-friendly organization in the technology industry, in the software industry, uh, where you typically think of these things as being uh, uh, disjoint. Um, what that means is that today we have five generations of workers in our workforce. Uh, we make software to manage uh, HR across um, across large uh, large enterprises and use use our own lessons in the software. And we the the way it works is we spend nine figures per year in learning and training and development. We're well aware that by growing up as a German company and having a German um, center of gravity, the burden is on us to keep our, uh, our European workforce connected to what's happening in the Valley and in the, in the rest of the world. Uh, the third and, and final story perhaps comes from uh, the, the last four or five years in the stuttering, stuttering community, where thanks to the King's Speech and some several and several prominent role models like Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson, who have come out finally as people who stutter, uh, there's been a change in how it's perceived. Uh, what was typically seen as, as a constraint is now a strength. And I think that's the commonality between each of these stories. In Estonia, you had a, 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 a geopolitical uh, and a human, a human capital constraint at a country level. At, 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 at SAP, you had a philosophy and values uh, uh, constraint as European values and Silicon Valley values kind of uh, uh, clash in, in the industry. And, at, uh, and in, the, in these, these stuttering community, you almost had a reputational constraint. And this forced all three ecosystems to come up with their own pathways and their own uh, approaches to keeping their people relevant and engaged in, frankly, in, in an increasingly volatile world. Um, so thank you for letting me spend some time sharing those stories. I hope they sparked something interesting and provided uh, a bit of a transition from the, the afternoon program now as you wrap up. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So let me invite Sabine, Raquel, Marcelo, come up on stage and um, let's continue talking about some of the uh, European and the South, Amer <coughs> South American perspectives. Um, let's see, Raquel, why don't you go in the middle? Marcelo, why don't you take the end seat? We'll put Sabine here. And while Jason's uh, making the connection, let me begin the introductions because this is a really a very special group of people. Uh, Sabine Remdich is a professor of personal and organizational psychology and head of the Institute of Performance Management at Lufana University, Lundberg. Uh, her focus, and she's been a visiting scholar with uh, HSTAR for a number of years, uh, is leadership in and working in the digital world. And she uh, has uh, repeatedly um, uh, brought 
uh, representatives of German companies to Silicon Valley to give them some exposure to, uh, I guess I would call it the fast lane, but the, the mindset that we're thinking of here and um, is coaching those companies uh, in the organizational change that they're in the midst of and uh, also doing some research in that. Let me introduce uh, Raquel Coelho, who's a PhD student and a fellow of the Le Mans Center uh, in Stanford's Graduate School of Education. Uh, she has an MA degree in Comparative International Education and an undergraduate degree in Portuguese and Brazilian Literature from the Federal University in Minas Gerais, Brazil. And over the past few years, she's been working with children and adults um, in a variety of countries. She's particularly interested in helping students, but she's also working with MediaX in this capacity of helping to tell important stories and the tools and techniques for doing that. And very happy to have you with us. Uh, Marcelo Tournier. Thanks for being here. I know you came a long way to be with us. He's director of the SESI program. That stands for Social Service of Industry. It's a program in Brazil that uh, has an innovation center that's looking at the health, environment, and safety of the manufacturing workers. And SESI has been a member of MediaX for for five years now, and we've uh, collaborated on uh, technologies and programs that can inspire both the employers and the employees to think about working. And now he is uh, working with Marcelo Guimaras from Sapiens Park uh, on some ecosystem perspectives of a new uh, program, new model for educating the high-skilled workers uh, that are needed not only for the established companies but the small medium enter enterprises that are being established because of the successful innovation activities in Santa Catarina. So let's begin with Sabine. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to share the German workforce perspective with you today. Um, digitalization is the challenge, is the challenge for the German economy at the moment, so digital transformation has fundamentally changed the way how Germany is doing business or has to do business right now, and also has changed the way we look for um, for work uh, for the for the workforce. So the skills have changed that we uh, that we need. Uh, as you can see here, made in Germany. That's a motto over dec decades where we have been really proud of. So we are. Uh, proud of the uh, engineering excellence that we have as Germans, but now we have to learn that it's not all about products anymore. It's also about uh, data. It's about the um, the digital skills, and this is what we what we now need. We realize that there's a lack of skilled workers, especially in the IT sector, and that's what we are what we are looking for. Um, so the, uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing uh, in, this, uh, in my, uh, my project right now, the project is called the Leadership Garage. The Leadership Garage helps companies to get prepared for the, for the, digital, prep, uh, for the digital age. We help uh, companies to prepare uh, the digital trans and go through the digital transformation. Um, and especially we focus on the skills that we can train and where we can help the people uh, of these companies in, in Germany uh, to get trained and to get the competencies they need to fulfill all the jobs they have to do in the digital transformation. And we focus, that's why the name is Leadership Garage, we focus on the leaders because they especially are ambassadors in the digital transformation and they have to gain a lot of new skills. If you look at that um, slide now, you see the companies we work with and what you find out really quickly is that big companies, large companies. Right? And those were, in Germany, the, the first movers, so to speak. They have the money, um, they are mainly working internationally, globally, and they started with doing the digital transformation. Um, the smaller and medium-sized companies are only, just have started to, to go on their way, and the, the awareness has just, uh, is just there right now. So a couple of years ago, three years ago, when we started with the Leadership Garage, I also asked, 
SME companies if they want to join and they said no we don't have time for that there's no need for that uh, and now uh, the, this has, uh, has fundamentally changed. So let me uh, talk about what is so special about Germany about the SME structure. So if I'm talking about SME, SME, uh, we call it the German Mittelstand. And if you Google Mittelstand, it's already in there. So obviously it's a, it's a, it's a common word right now. And the German Mittelstand, that's the cornerstone of the German economy. So if you, uh, let me give you a definition. So the German Mittelstand means up to 250 employees and uh, up to 50 million euro turnover, annual turnover. Um, and then there's another group of uh, companies that belong to the German Mittelstand, that is companies that are, uh, that, that have in one person the owner and the CEO. So that's family owned businesses. And why am I telling you that uh, if I'm talking about the German economy? Because 99% of the German uh, companies are SMEs. So the German Mittelstand means 99%. So that's why these uh, companies are so uh, important for us. If we look um, at their current situation, and there is a study that has been done in January this, this year, we, we find out that uh, three out of five of these Mittelstand companies are very satisfied with their own business situation. So they have, a, uh, have enough to do, they earn enough mo money, everything's fine. But there is one thing they also report, namely the shortage of skilled profession uh, professionals. And 50% uh, of uh, the, the companies that were asked in this, uh, in this study, they said, okay, we are running into a, a, a huge problem. A, a, one of the major future challenge is um, that we are running short of people. So that was, by the way, the top answer in that list of, of future challenges. And that led us, this led us to the, uh, to the fact that we said, okay, we have to look deeper into that. What makes some of the SME or some of the Mittelstand companies really successful in attracting people? Others are not successful. And uh, if I report the, the results of our study, we asked around 600 um, employees what makes um, an employer attractive. And we can learn from them that from the answers that those six factors that make, um, uh, make employ employers highly attractive. This is trust and management, interesting motivating work environment to identify uh, if, if people can identify with the com company values, if the reputation of the company is high, if they have good relationships with supervisors and colleagues, and the family friendness, uh, uh, friendliness uh, of the company. Uh, but that's not enough because we have one overlaying factor, which is nowadays the digital culture. So more and more the young generation, the people ask for, okay, are you really on your way as a company, on your way into the digital future? So people don't want to work with Excel sheets anymore. They don't want to do paperwork with pencil. They want to be in a, in a work surrounding which is really, um, which is a, a digital work surrounding. And that's why we said, okay, how uh, can the Leadership Garage, our project, how can we um, help out with this? And we did a study asking the companies we work with, what are the success factors of the future, of the digital future? So how can you set up a digital work culture? How can you become digital? And um, what we, what we found out were five factors, and you can see them here, and we called these five factors switches, because you have to switch them on in order to be highly successful in the digital world. Uh, that is workplace, which means flexibility in, in the way how you work, where you work, uh, collaborative uh, work environment, then we have empowerment, so the, the people of today, they want to participate in decision-making processes, they want to get feedback, they want to be empowered. You need leaders, and we found with the leaders, we found that the leader of the future has to be a networker, a good storyteller, and a coach. 
So you have to work with the leaders and of course you need the innovation culture. We looked a little bit deeper into the question, what in particular does the leader of the future, of the digital future have to learn? What do the leaders have to learn? And uh, we found a list of competencies that are uh, important for the, for the digital age and that you can see them here. It's network leadership, leading innovation, remote leadership, power as a leader, uh, visionary leadership, and finally health leadership. So those were the six different competencies that came out of our study and that was a study based on 800 um, self-reports from, from leaders, from large companies in this way. Um, and you can see that they're, they're, these 800 people, the leaders, they report um, where they have to gain more knowledge. So you see that there's a skill gap uh, in, in certain areas, so visionary leadership, so the Germans are not good storytellers, right? So that's one thing. We also have to learn about networking. Networking um, skills, that's something leaders want to, to learn about, and also about healthy leadership, so how to deal with the thing that you can be always on in the digital world, um, how to deal with those kind of problems. And this is what we learned in our leadership uh, garage project about what's going on and how to prepare and what the people want to learn. And now the, the, the final question is, uh, how do we move on with that? Because we learn from the huge companies because the SME, the German Mittelstand, is just on its way to the digital transformation. And what we want to do right now is setting up a new leadership garage group for the German Mittelstand. And uh, this is going to begin in, in January and um, we hope that we can set up a new mindset to fuel the German innovation by that. And the, the huge question now is, uh, what can we transform from what we have learned so far from the huge companies? What can we transfer to the uh, German Mittelstand company? And what do we have uh, to relearn? Because if you look at the Mittelstand, those are small companies. Uh, therefore, they are more agile than the huge uh, companies. They are mostly family-owned, so that means that the, de uh, the decision-making processes are really fast. So because of, if I'm the owner, I can decide on what I want to do. Um, so we have now the situation, we have startups, a lot of them in Berlin, but that's only uh, that's part of the economy. We have the large corporations and then we have the German Mittelstand with 99%. And those now have to find their way uh, into the digital transformation and into uh, the, the way how they want to learn and what they want to learn and how we can prepare them. If you want to follow up what we are doing, please feel, uh, feel free to check up our website. Uh, we will just bring everything on there. Thank you. Well, you heard a little bit from Martin Carnoy this morning about uh, some of his perspectives on uh, the importance of training as well as uh, investment in the infrastructure. Uh, Raquel Coelho is playing dual role. She works with MediaX. She's a fellow of the Le Mans Center and participate uh, in the, um, some of the activities that we have ongoing with the Brazilian transportation sector. So Raquel. Uh, really quick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a second. Uh, as Martha mentioned, I'm a graduate student at the School of Education here at Stanford, but I'm not here today to talk about my research. I think you're all very tired, and I don't want to give you a reason to stand up and leave. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about something more excited. Um, for the past two months, I've been working with MediaX in a project in Brazil with a training institution called CEST Senat uh, that is linked to tr the transportation sector firms in Brazil. CEST Senat provides uh, professional development, but also healthcare and well being promotion uh, projects for service workers in the transportation sector in Brazil. And it's financed uh, by the collection of compulsory. Uh, compulsory contributions from the transportation sector firms uh, in Brazil. Recently, I attended a 
Conference on Professional Development in Sao Paulo with the CES Senate Executive, and he needed a drive to the airport. I wanted to call him an Uber, but he was very reluctant. So I asked him, why? And he said to me, well, I work with taxi drivers. I can't betray them. So eventually, he was willing to take an Uber. He took an Uber, actually. But when we were saying goodbye, he came to me and said, please don't tell everyone I took an Uber. But why am I telling you this story? <laughs> yeah. Because it presents the tensions being experienced by the transportation sector in Brazil with the technological transformations in transport. And adapt to that is hard. And just as the SAS Senat executive was ultimately willing to take an Uber, SAS Senat is recognizing that to provide quality service in the transportation sector in Brazil, they need to innovate and they need to provide training in those innovations. So for instance, in, in July, uh, an innovation that they have recently adopted before July, uh, it was not July, I'm gonna tell you why I said July, is the use of simulators to support the training of truck and bus drivers. As you can see in the photo, Martha, which is not quite clear, found an opportunity for <laughs> I didn't hit the horse. <laughs> <laughs> An opportunity to improvement in the test. She actually, she failed the test, but. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition, Seth Senat has been recognizing that students in their classrooms are not really engaged. And, they, and that the transportation firms often resist sending their workers for additional training. So they are adopting a new frame that includes uh, improved instructional design, design to increase student engagement and also increase the probability that the transportation companies will send their workers for continue the training. And how are they going about this latter part? Well, there is also some interesting work being done in Brazil through the Lemon Center, of which I'm a fellow. Since 2015, the Lemon Center has been partnering with universities in Brazil to implement an innovative professional development program that is modeled after the Stanford Teacher Education Program at Stanford, and more commonly known as STEP. So Sassanat is has been seeing this work, Lemon Center work, which has, has very similar goals to the ones that Sessanat is pursuing now. So MediaX uh, is working to facilitate exploratory conversations between Sessanat faculty at Stanford and universities working with the Lemon Center in Brazil that would be interested in helping Sessanat to rethink their professional development programs. So we at MediaX have been persuasive at convincing Sestanat that active learning is the way to go. And Stanford experts in their area are now beginning to work with Sestanat to rethink or to change the grammar of instruction in their classrooms of their more than a hundred in their 143 units all over Brazil. Thank you very much. Staying in Brazil for a bit, Marcelo, uh, tell us about the program that you're embarking on. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, Marta, thank you for the kind invitation. I would like to also to, to thank, in behalf of CERT, my friend Marcelo and Jose Eduardo Fiatis, who stayed in Brazil, but good friends and partners that presented us to Stanford Media X and also That's right. uh, they are helping me to fulfill a dream that I had 13 years ago. Wow. So I just like to start with a story because uh, during my college in the Federal University of Santa Catarina, I always entered at the building of the medical school and the, at the other side of the street was the biggest building inside the university, which is from Certi Foundation. 
And I always look at that, that building and people always say and wonder that, uh, look, this building in the university is where they take care of a lot of different technological projects and they are very well funded <laughs> instead of our medical school who are uh, facing some budget problems at the time I was a student. But I always had the dream to work in different projects with different people from different backgrounds. And now, 13 years later, I'm working with my good friends at CERT mm -hmm. in presenting a proposal that we have that we are maturing on, but it is based in decades of excellency of all of those organizations that are showing right now, which is the Federal University of Santa Catarina, the Federation of the Industries of Santa Catarina, in which Raquel explained very well uh, the, the, the system is almost the same system as the SEST Senat, but it takes care of uh, manufacturing industry in Brazil and manufacturing industry of workers also to promote their competitiveness. This is the uh, umbrella organization in which I belong. It is the, Federal, the, the, the Federation of Industries of Santa Catarina and also the social service of industry. Uh, also, we have here Sapiens Park, which is an uh, ecosystem in which a lot of research institutions from universities, startups, and even uh, institutions from SESI and SENAI belong now, working for develop new innovations for the ecosystem. And uh, now we are joining some of those uh, desires that we have to improve collaboration, to develop a concept that's uh, very new in Brazil, which is uh, an ecosystem-based university in which we will drive learning and also drive new ventures using immersive technologies. So uh, just give you a quick overview of Sapiens Park. This is an area of uh, 1,066 acres in the northern part of Florianópolis. So this area uh, now is being uh, installed, uh, in, in this place is being installed a lot of different companies, a lot of different uh, research institutes. And uh, this place has a proposal to be an ecosystem in which we will have the university, the government, private companies, and the society working in a network to develop new solutions to uh, foster innovation and also to develop new competencies. We believe that with this proposal and taking an ecosystem as a value. And uh, we had the opportunity this morning to hear uh, Professor Carnoy talking about the importance of teams for this. To have teams of students in these communities working in four main pillars of knowledge, which is uh, the, the engineering or uh, business school, arts and humanities, creative economy, and also uh, health and life sciences to, in a multidisciplinary fashion, create new value propositions for the society. So using those environments, those co-creative environments, and also the shared assets from those organizations, we have the expectation to build living and dynamic labs and working environments in which we could integrate those students working in projects in which they could learn, they could uh, experiment those new ventures, and also they could uh, test those ventures into the market. So we believe that this will bring out the culture of innovation for companies who are needing this, and also we will uh, bring to the ecosystem people 
and talent who is very needed in our place. So this uh, is interesting to, to note that we are envisioning this kind of framework with the support of immersive technologies and immersive learning environments to increase this experience and promote a better integration between students, their mentors, and the locus in which these projects will be uh, conducted. So though, uh, this experience platform is uh, being concepted as a dynamic uh, case-based studies in learning and for authentic storytelling and also for story doing, per, uh, allowing people to uh, be authors in these narratives and journeys. Also, it is important to uh, note that we need to keep people engaged and those gamification strategies uh, for learning and also for learning to create some kind of knowledge economy and to foster the engagement and the exchange between all of those stakeholders. And finally, uh, it is important to see also that uh, there, there could be a good use of uh, new immersive technologies like mobile technologies, 3D, uh, virtual reality or mixed reality, augmented reality, and also uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain, Internet of Things. And uh, just to clarify some of those idea-based learning that we are mentioning, uh, we were wondering uh, why not to create this environment for teams uh, working on those projects together and learning as a team, learning with their multidisciplinary uh, and uh, people from life sciences learning from people from arts and humanities and these exchange of knowledge is uh, starting to bring new innovation and new uh, value propositions that could be built as value, not only in terms of knowledge for the students, but in terms of new ventures for companies and investors for the ecosystem. So this is uh, the idea in which we were uh, discussing about case-based learning or idea-based learning or venture-based learning to uh, bring those benefits to the ecosystem. So we believe that uh, could bring more efficient learning and more uh, practical learning for uh, develop seniority in those teams and also to engage those professionals into uh, high impact projects and initiatives and also to promote the scaling up of this knowledge and start to engage people in a more practical and practical focused learning and enhance and empower people through knowledge collaboration and integration. So uh, this is the message that, sh that uh, we would like to share with you and uh, we would like to, also would love to hear your thoughts about it. This is an idea that is bringing out from proof of concept for, for a quick MVP that we will be testing with uh, some key companies inside the, this partnership network and we will be very glad to be here again in the next time to show you some preliminary results. Thank you. They're all pioneers. They deserve uh, our uh, respect, our, um, our applause. Uh, again, I'm going to ask you to help me thank them. And I love that uh, we have, both from the corporate environment here in the United States, experiments that are happening abroad. As Roy said this morning, we're going to learn from each other. There are things that we can do by working together that are different than any of us could do alone. And uh, we hope that these experiments that you're undertaking will be a learning opportunity for all of us, um, as with the others that we heard earlier today. So uh, join me, please, in thanking them again. Thank you.